Hi, I'm Mike Steven, and this is Gear Up. You know what? The winters can get pretty cold here in Canada, and here's a few accessories that can maybe help you bear the winter a little bit better. Uh, first off, we're going to talk about cold feet. Man, cold feet are the worst. So, companies have come up with some pretty neat little toys, like these guys right here. These are down booties, so think of them as little sleeping bags for your feet. So whether you're doing a backcountry hiking or a skiing trip, these things collapse and fold up nice and small because that's one of the benefits of down. They're nice and lightweight so that if you do have to pack them in somewhere, uh, you're not packing a bunch of extra weight. Also, these things work just fine as slippers in the house. Uh, so if you got a cold floors in your house first thing in the morning, you can slide right into a little down sleeping bag. If you have to go start the car, you still have soles on the bottom to be able to run outside for a couple seconds. So these little guys, little down slippers, pretty awesome. Whether you're the backcountry person or whether you're just using them around the house, they make the winter a little bit more comfortable. Staying with footwear, let's move to these guys right here. We've all heard of chains for our vehicles. These are chains for your boots. So a lot of times what happens is we get a lot of freeze thaw. So uh, the snow comes, starts to melt, freezes back up and you've got sheets of ice all over the place. Uh, by throwing these guys on your boots, it ensures that you will have great grip all the time, whether you're transitioning onto pavement, uh, dirt, uh, or ice, they, they grip pretty good on all aspects because they have the metal points to be able to grip on the ice, but you still have a lot of your rubber showing through so that you're gonna grip still on pavement and stuff like that. So these little guys can be just be attached onto any boot. They're quite easy to take on and off. They're quite small, just slide them on, and this will give you good traction in the wintertime so you don't take that nasty spill. Gonna clear a couple more things off the table. Well, I had to bring this uh, in because, well, you know what, you're not a good Canadian unless uh, you have a few toques, and I think we're the only guys calling them those toques. But you know what, uh, a lot of people don't know, but you lose most of your heat in the wintertime through your head. So if you can throw a toque on, it's gonna keep the heat in you a lot better. Uh, you're going to stay warm. The first thing to do in a cold situation is throw a toque on, throw your hood up. Uh, so if you find yourself uh, getting a little chilly, cover your head. So a toque's a great way to do it and why not do it stylish. Next up to bat, these guys. These guys are pretty cool. So these guys are uh, at first glance something very, very simple. It's just a piece of cloth into a tube and what these guys can do is these guys I use year round. I always have this in my coat pocket in the winter time because it can be multitasked into many things. If you look on this little card here, you can see all the different uses, uses for this thing. They call them buffs or uh, neck warmers. The little bit longer ones are a lot nicer so that you can actually transform it into a tube. You can transform it into a neck gaiter. It can seal the, the gap between your jacket and your helmet if you're skiing or snowboarding. Um, it can just be useful for almost anything in the winter. What it does is it cuts the wind off you and cuts the cold off you and allows you to be much more comfortable in colder temperatures. And as you can see, folds up into absolute nothing. So there's no reason why you can't have that slipped in your pocket at all times always carry one of these uh, in the backcountry, and I usually carry one in my jacket at all times. Here we go, this guy's fun. This is a lash, lashing strap. It's used to hold skis together, but man, you can use way more uses than that. You can use it for lashing things to snowmobiles, to quads, to your backpack. I leave one of these just rolled up on my backpack and lashed onto my backpack because they're really easy to use. They're exceptionally strong. They'll hold virtually anything you want to carry um, and they're very, very durable. So to have a couple of these in your backpack when you go hiking or backcountry touring, uh, anything outdoors makes, uh, makes life a little bit easier if you do have to lash something extra onto your backpack. And it simply just goes through this right here. You pull it tight and it holds. So it's really fast and easy to put on. And again, it's one of those things that weighs absolutely nothing. So a good thing to carry with you when you take off uh, in the snow. Now what we're gonna talk about is we're gonna talk about uh, uh, another thing that happens with this, this winter type weather is the days are a lot shorter. So with shorter days, uh, you might be walking or, uh, or riding your bike or whatever you're doing in the winter time, but you're probably gonna be doing it in low light conditions, if not the dark. Uh, by the time most of us get off work, uh, it is dark. So these guys are kind of neat. It's a, a, a light that basically can attach 
it onto most places of your body. You can throw it on your wrist, just snaps, goes around your wrist. You can put it on a leg, you can put it around a backpack. Again, it's just a really versatile light that gives you the ability to be seen uh, uh, by traffic and other people so that you don't have an unfortunate accident. But something really small, simple, keep you safe out there in uh, these uh, times when there's a lot less light. We talked about hiking in the backcountry and stuff like that. Um, these guys are kind of neat. A lot of people know about these, but they're collapsible poles. So collapsible poles is just another thing for you to be nice and stable out there in the winter. Because your footing isn't quite as sure, uh, it's nice to be able to use poles when you walk. A lot of people use them in the summer, uh, and man, in the winter it makes all the more sense because your footing is that much more unsure in the winter time. So whether it be just a walk around the block or uh, you're heading off into the backcountry, uh, a collapsible pole is a nice thing. The reason why I recommend collapsible is so that you can set your heights. So you always don't want your pole at the same length. Sometimes you might want it a little bit longer because you're really kind of pushing off the pole. For example, when you ski down, you probably want to shorten it to your correct ski length so you can actually shorten that height. The other thing is it makes it transferable between you and your family members. So uh, anybody can pick up this set of poles and that'll be the right height for them. The other neat thing about the poles like this is that you can take the baskets on and off. So in the winter time, if there's powder snow, hey, great, throw the basket on, it just screws on. If, uh, if there is no powder snow, thread the basket off and uh, you've got uh, nothing to get caught on in brush and stuff like that. That's probably the biggest reason why you'd want to take the basket off is if you're hiking uh, in, uh, in a tight trail or cross country and you push the pole through some brush, uh, this can kind of hook. And, uh, hook up and uh, not make it as easy to get the pole back. Um, they come with a comfortable grip. They also come with this uh, extra little grip down here. Uh, it's kind of a neat feature, this extra little grip. A lot of times when you're in the backcountry, this is a little bit more backcountry specific, but when you're in the backcountry, when you're doing what are called switchbacks to get to the top of a mountain or to the top of a steep hill, um, one of your hands is on the downhill side, so it's quite low. One of your hands is on the uphill side, so it's getting pushed up high. So you can actually use this on the uphill side, this on the downhill side, to allow your poles to be nice and balanced and uh, be able to give you some extra uh, footing from your pole if you need it. So that's kind of backcountry poles. I had to show you these just because they're way too cool. This is a neat uh, winter accessory. A lot of people up on the ski hill or snowmobiling complain about like little gaps where the wind is coming in and the snow is coming in and all that kind of stuff. This, this goggle company has actually figured out a way to make ensure that there is no gap between your goggle and your uh, buff or your balaclava, whatever you want to call it. And it's actually magnetic. So it's really easy to pull down, just snaps back up into place so that you are seamless. Around here, we don't get the minus 30, minus 40 that often. But places that do get that, it only takes 30 seconds a minute to frostbite your skin, especially when you're moving on a sled or moving on skis. So having that sealed up is really nice. For us around here, it's just a nice comfort feature. Okay, speaking of on the mountain, there's little guys like this. Uh, a lot of people like to carry their music or carry their phone with them everywhere they go. This is one thing that can allow you to do it on the mountain if you want to. And what it is, is uh, they're earbuds, they're wireless. They just go into your ears. Again, you don't have to be digging things through, rooting wires. They're wireless earbuds that you can actually operate uh, on the hill. The, they've gone one step further and done a product uh, that they call chips. And chips can actually insert right into your helmet's ear flaps. Uh, and the neat thing about that is that you can actually access the paws uh, uh, through your ear flap uh, so that you can have, you can take a phone call on the mountain or you can uh, listen to your favorite music on the mountain. So kind of wireless technology, uh, taking it into the uh, snow sports is always a little bit of a challenge simply because of battery. Uh, so your battery times are going to be affected by how cold it is, but uh, it'll definitely give you some run time out there. Next up to bat, we're going to talk about uh, waterproofing yourself. So a lot of you have purchased jackets and uh, have nice ski pants, but the waterproofing is just starting to lose its uh, ability to repel the water. Um, so there's the typical spray-ons that you can use, and that works. It, it doesn't do a great job, but it does the trick. If you want to do a really good job, a lot of times what people will do is they'll buy these products. And what the products are is first you have 
a wash. So the first thing you're going to do is wash it with your regular detergent. You're going to wash your, say your, the way I do it personally is I wash my jacket, my pants, and my gloves. So I wash all three things because one bottle of Repel will do three items like that. So the first thing you do is you wash it with Tide or whatever uh, uh, detergent you're going to use. The next thing you're going to do is you're going to wash it with the wash. The reason why you wash it with this wash is because it cleans all the soap residue off the jacket so that the waterproofing agent doesn't stick to soap residue and then just flake off. So this, a bottle of this will last you quite a long time because you only need to use a small amount for each wash load. This, you're going to dump the whole thing in and you're going to again put it in your washing machine. You're going to have your jacket, your pants and your gloves in there goes through a washing cycle. At the end of a washing cycle, you put it in the dryer. The dryer heats and activates a layer, and the layer that is over top or, or outermost on the jacket will now become waterproof again. It's called a DWR coating. Most companies, uh, their jackets will come with a DWR coating on it. You can even put DWR coatings on hoodies and stuff like that to make them actually repel water for a certain period of time. So DWR does wear off in time, but you know what? It's also a thing that you can just kind of keep up so you can get a few extra years out of those jackets and pants that you've spent good money on. Alongside that, you've got your footwear. So you've got your leather boots and stuff like that that you're wearing out in the winter time. When you're wearing leather boots, uh, salt is not only hard on your vehicles, it's also hard on the leather in your boots and stuff like that. So if you can keep up on the protection of the leather of your boots, it'll keep A, the boot more waterproof, and B, it'll uh, also keep the leather soft and supple and keep it from drying out from all that salt or the material that they're using on the roads to de-ice. And guess what? People that wear glasses or goggles, there's a little accessory for you called anti-fog. Anti-fog is just a layer that you can put on your glasses, your goggles, all, so all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, and what it does is it creates a layer that absorbs water. So as you're sweating uh, and perspiring, the, the, the vapor is being caught in the barrier and not condensing on the lens and creating fog. So this will work for any number of things. Guys use them for hockey visors, you use them uh, for uh, snowmobile visors, goggles, glasses, any eyewear that you can kind of think of. I've heard of people using it on optics like binoculars and stuff like that to help when you first put binoculars up to your eyes when it's cold out because uh, the, the heat off your face will generate fog. So you know what? I hope this helps. This is a few things that kind of make winter a little bit nicer for me. I sure enjoy the winter and uh, thanks again for watching Gear Up. This has been Mike Steven. Hi, I'm Mike Steven, and this is Gear Up. You know what, a lot of people think of cycling as a summertime activity or sport, but realistically in the Kootenays, you can cycle 365 days of the year. It takes a little bit of extra uh, preparedness on your part, it takes a little bit of extra gear, but you know what, you can comfortably cycle right through the winter. I'm going to show you a few things that will help you do that and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the specific stuff that uh, uh, the bike industry has done to target the snow market. So first off we'll talk about the thing that's blatantly obviously sitting right in front of me here. These guys are fat bikes. The fat refers to the width of the tire up front. You're looking at a four to a five inch wide tire on this thing. It's all about surface area or flotation. So this style of bike uh, has a misconception with people of thinking that you can ride three feet of powder in it. No, what it's designed for is more like your cross country trails. So uh, the hard pack uh, cross country trails up at the, up at the resort, uh, also uh, things like uh, snowshoe trails and stuff like that work great. And then the fat bikers themselves have started to groom trails. They get groomed about yay wide and you've got this snow path through the forest that you can ride on quite comfortably with these balloon tires. At first you might think that you could ride on your regular bike, but your regular bike will penetrate too deep into that snow and it will, uh, you won't have a fun ride, it's just going to be a lot of work and you're not going to get anywhere. Uh, so these big balloon tires allow you to stay 
up on the top of the snow and actually carry some speed through the trails. Uh, so depending on the winter, whether there's lots of snow, less snow, um, it really depends on whether you actually need that bigger flotation. Because in the uh, event of a, of a winter where we just don't get a lot of snow, it's a lot of freeze thaw, there's a lot of ice and mixed dirt and a little bit of snow, but it's all pretty firm, you can run a straight up studded tire. So just like cars have studded tires, so do, uh, so do bicycles. So you've got extra studs in here, lots of siping, soft rubber compound. So uh, when you're transitioning from pavement to ice, uh, it's seamless. Uh, you've got lots of grip on the pavement with the soft rubber and uh, lots of grip on the ice. You actually, believe it or not, have more grip on ice. When those studs bite in, they grab really quite impressively. Um, so this would be, I would say, more for your commuter type person and the odd time up, say, in the community forest or in the trails, uh, whereas this would be focused, I would say, more towards trail riding. Um, one of the things that I tell people all the time is uh, they say, well, what about commuting to and from work? Uh, what kind of bike do you recommend for that? I actually recommend you buying a really inexpensive bike. Go down to your secondhand shops and buy something inexpensive. The reason being, the winter is exceptionally hard on bikes. <laughs> this, uh, the salt and the wet all the time uh, plays havoc on the drivetrains. Uh, so that if you buy like an inexpensive bike uh, from like one of the thrift stores or the secondhand stores, uh, you're just gonna get good life out of it. It's gonna work reasonably well. And to do your commuting needs, it works for most people. However, some people, hey, they love biking. They wanna ride their bike in the winter. A lot of people use what's called a single speed bike. Because in the winter time, uh, if, you're, if you're commuting, we do get those days when there's a fair bit of snow falling. When a fair bit of snow falls, the, the gears tend to, to jam up with snow. They actually get plugged up a little bit with the snow and you run into some skipping issues where the bike just doesn't want to pedal smoothly at all. So a lot of guys are going to single speeds for that. And a single speed bike also is a less expensive way to go because there's less uh, machinery on the bike, less components on the bike. It's a little bit less money. So hey, that's not a bad idea as well. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about now about uh, some preventative measures that you can do. Uh, one of the biggest things you can do in the winter time is keep your chain lubed, keep your drivetrain lubed. You kind of want to cover it in the oil as opposed to the summer. Summer you don't want to cover your entire bike because it's just going to pick up dust and pick up dirt and basically make an oil-based sandpaper out of your uh, chain lubricant. Uh, whereas in the winter time, because there isn't much dust out there and you want to try to pr protect against the corrosion of the water, the corrosion of the salt on the roads and stuff like that, uh, you can use your chain lube a little bit more liberally and try to coat your drivetrain a little bit more to help protect it. Uh, being very careful to stay away from if you have a bike with disc brakes. Uh, lube and disc brakes don't get along well. So um, you're definitely going to want to keep it away from those areas of the bike and don't put so much on that it's splattering all over the place and contaminating your discs. Uh, the next thing that's definitely different when you're out there is uh, the light level. Man, uh, there's parts of the winter that you go to work in the dark and you come home in the dark. So at that point, it's really important to be seen by vehicles. Because the shoulders of the road are much smaller uh, because of plow banks and snow and stuff like that, it's that much more important that you're very, very visible to vehicles. People use reflective bands. I think reflective bands are great. Having said that, one of the neat things that this tire has is it has a reflective band built right into the sidewall of the tire. So they're thinking about these kinds of things. The industry is really thinking about your safety. Uh, so reflective bands, they do a good job. But if you follow my way of thinking on this, a reflective band only works once the lights are on you. <laughs> that might be a little bit too late. I'd rather be seen before the lights are on me. And that's why battery powered light systems are honestly the ticket in the winter time. You will be seen from a lot further distance. You need a flasher for the back, in my opinion, something that's bright and flashing, usually red, uh, and flashing in the back so that, uh, again, that car that might be a little bit distracted sees that flashing light and gives you plenty of room. The front, light, the front light on the bicycle is for two purposes. One, to be seen by oncoming traffic. And secondly, uh, if you decide to ride trails at night, because a lot of times that's the only time you can ride, a light like this, believe it or not, will light up the entire trail. Um, lights used to be very expensive that you had to use for night riding. They've really come down in price with technology uh, coming down. Um, 
uh, as the technology kind of increases, the price seems to come down. So uh, with these guys here, this is 1600 lumen, so exceptionally bright. You could definitely ride a, uh, a trail in the, the, the pitch black, not a star or moon in the sky. Uh, you could see perfectly through a single track trail. So uh, they're nice and small. They're about the size of a flashlight. They can mount on your handlebar. I prefer to mount mine on my helmet because then it's looking where I'm looking. Uh, I don't necessarily, I, I might be going around a corner over here and I'm looking at the corner. I don't need to see here. I need to look where I'm going. So I prefer it on my helmet. Uh, a lot of people just throw them on their bars for commuting, whereas more of the trail riders will probably throw it onto their helmet. So lights are a big aspect of uh, winter riding, I would say for sure. The other uh, pieces of the puzzle is when you're, when you're uh, commuting, you still want to wear a helmet. So there's kind of two options. Some people just use, uh, if, if they're already a skier or a snowboarder, they just throw their ski and snowboard helmets on because they have nice uh, flaps on the bottom to keep your ears warm, uh, seal up against the cold a little bit better for those cold morning rides. Um, or the other option is use your bicycle helmet, but then just add in a nice thin toque or uh, a, a headband to cover your ears. I find the biggest thing that gets cold is my ears and I don't want my body to be getting really hot and then the cold air going into my ear canal. I find that painful. Some people have more problems with that or less problems with that, but at least covering your ears will really help you out there uh, on your commute or your trail ride. Uh, I touched uh, on these guys briefly on uh, one of the other Gear Up episodes, but I'll touch on it again because just how useful they are. This is a buff. It can go in, it can seal your jacket up, so you zip up your jacket. This guy goes over your head, it's like a neck gaiter, goes in, it can seal up that. If it gets cold, you just pull it up over your nose. A lot of times in the winter, I will wear goggles on the bike, so you can just tuck that under the goggles. Then you have uh, the, the cold wind isn't hitting anywhere on your face. You've got goggles covering your eyes, helmet covering your head, then this guy just snuck in covering the rest of your face because not everybody can grow this. But uh, what else do we have? We have hands. Next up to bat. Uh, Keeping your hands warm is super important. Your hands are what control the brake levers, your shift levers, all that kind of stuff, keeps your steering in check. So you want your hands to be comfortable, warm, and dry. These are two different styles of gloves that uh, I would recommend. If, uh, if it's a warmer day or you're more resistant to the cold, a glove is probably your best option for the simple fact that you have the most dexterity and the most control. Um, whereas people that uh, have really cold hands, Keeping your fingers in pairs with these lobster claw gloves will keep your hands a little bit warmer and you still have the ability to operate your brake lever uh, with a lobster claw and most shift levers are your thumb. So you've still got the ability to control everything on the bike but your hand will be a little bit warmer. So really important in a glove to stop the uh, water, stop the wind and create a little bit of insulation for you. For commuting where you're doing shorter trips, uh, you, probably won't need it, uh, you probably won't need as thick a glove. But also, uh, when you're out in the trails, you probably don't need a super thick glove because you're going to be working a little bit harder. And that leads me into talking about uh, the way you dress on your upper body. When you're dressed on your upper body and lower body uh, for cycling, it's very similar to cross-country skiing. Uh, most people's first mistake is overdressing, wearing too much, or wearing uh, thick layers. What you want to do is have multiple thin layers uh, of clothing so that you can peel layers off. You've got a layer next to your body and that should be designed to wick sweat away from your body. Your next layer is insulation. So depending on how cold it is, is how much insulation you need. Your final layer is a protection against the, the, the snow, the wind, uh, rain if it's raining that day. So it's an outer shell to protect you. Uh, in most high output activities like cross country skiing, like uh, winter biking, you're actually gonna wanna not wear something that's as waterproof because as your waterproof level goes up, your breathability does drop, even with amazing fabrics like Gore-Tex that breathe extremely well for being 100% waterproof. I personally find that uh, even Gore-Tex, it, it doesn't breathe quite fast enough if I'm doing a high output activity. Uh, so I'll wear something that is water resistant versus waterproof. That way it blocks the wind, it helps keep the heat in, but it lets 
uh, a lot of that moisture uh, dissipate or get out through the jacket. And again, just choosing that, that middle layer, which is your insulation layer, choosing how thick you want to go there. You can use all sorts of stuff for that. You can use wool. Believe it or not, you can use cotton and hoodies and stuff. Doesn't work as well as wool, but it still works. It's still insulation value. So by adjusting that middle layer is how you keep yourself comfortable out there. The other thing that you'll find potentially in cross country and, and uh, snow biking is that keeping a little bit more consistent effort out there. So not spiking and then dropping, spiking and then dropping your heart rate. You're gonna try to be a little bit more consistent out there to stay comfortable. You know what? I hope some of these tips get you out there more often in the winter time, uh, whether it be on cross country skis or a bike, I think just being outside's a win. Uh, thanks for watching Gear Up. This has been Mike Steven.